Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome to The Time Is Now, a bipartisan solution to policing reform. My name is Sarita Bowen. I'm the events manager here at the Justice Action Network. Over the past five years that I've been here, we've really tried to educate people through our events. And along with our partner, bipartisan network of partners and lawmakers, we've been able to pass some meaningful reforms and get them across the finish line. So today I'm very excited about this issue because are very, very excited about this event because this is an issue that has uh, captured the attention of lawmakers, media outlets, and of course our communities. And it's really had an important implications at the local and federal levels. That uh, issue is policing reform. Today, our panelists have dedicated their careers to addressing some of these issues from accountability to seeking data-driven public safety solutions. We also have some very special remarks from Congresswoman Karen Bass. So let's go ahead and get started. I will now turn it over to Jan's President and Executive Director, Holly Harris. Thanks so much, Sarita. And we're very grateful for the incredible turnout uh, late on a Friday afternoon, just as DC is reopening and the world is looking a little more inviting. Um, as Sarita said, my name is Holly Harris and I'm the President and Executive Director of the Justice Action Network. We are the largest bipartisan organization working to reform our criminal justice system at both the state and the federal levels. You know, we've worked closely with many of you all on the big bipartisan success stories on the Hill, uh, prison and sentencing reform and fair chance hiring. And now during a time when there is overwhelming bipartisan consensus for reforming policing in America, we feel like it's more important than ever to be lifting up lawmakers who are willing to put partisanship aside and work in the best interests of the American people. And a lawmaker who's always willing to work across the aisle is Representative Karen Bass. Um, Representative Bass has been an integral part of every big bipartisan win uh, that we've had during my tenure at the Justice Action Network, which is well over half a decade now. And that she's at it again. She's a key player at the table, uh, helping to negotiate a bipartisan deal on policing reform. We're honored to have Representative Bass share opening remarks with us today. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. And thank you for the work that you do around our country transforming the criminal justice system. I've been excited over the last few years. There's been so many changes that have happened in so many different states and local communities and on a federal level. The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passed the House of Representatives on March 3rd and is in the Senate right now. I am very hopeful that we're gonna get it on President Biden's desk. And let me just say that the bill I think is a very important step forward but so much more needs to be done to transform policing in the United States. And I am hoping that the bill will serve as a catalyst for change that is already underway, but that we will extend that change to far more states and cities. Uh, three parts of the bill. The first part holds police accountable by allowing people to sue as well as prosecute officers who have uh, abused people or have, have resulted uh, in the death of individuals. Other parts of the bill talk about raising the standards of policing, having accreditation, having national standards and outlawing practices such as no-knock warrants and chokeholds. And then there's a part of the bill that calls for providing grants to communities so that we can begin to re-envision policing. One of the things I always say is that our movement needs to fight to refund communities because services have been cut on so many different levels and the social health and economic problems, we then expect the police to pick up the pieces. And I don't think most police officers go into policing so that they can deal with mental health issues, homelessness, substance abuse, et cetera. Those are health issues and health issues that need to be dealt with in the proper manner. So I just wanna thank you for the conversation and the briefing that you're having today. I look forward to continue working with you. I wanna especially uh, give a huge thanks to Dr. Joanna Schwartz, who has just been absolutely instrumental to many of us in Congress 
in terms of trying to understand how to bring about the transformation that is needed in our communities. And of course, to Holly, thank you so much for the work that you have done over these years. And I look forward to continue working with you as we continue to embark on changing, transforming the criminal justice system in our country. Thank you. Well, you've got to love a leader who always has her sunny side up, and that's Representative Bass. So thanks so much uh, to her and to her team. Um, and now in an effort to assist uh, Hill staff and key advocates um, as we're all working to make recommendations um, to lawmakers and, of course, to um, inform our friends in the press uh, who are working on uh, the policing reform uh, legislation um, uh, and reporting on the negotiations. It looks like we've got some men, Kim and Nick Fandos, Mary Ann, Jonathan Easley. You guys are some committed reporters. Really appreciate y'all being here today. Um, and we know that you're working furiously to find new angles to write about. Um, and so uh, as you are reporting on negotiations, we felt it was important to sort of move beyond the politics of a deal and do a deeper dive on the policies that are on the table. So we went to one of the nation's foremost experts on policing reform, and that's our friend Walter Katz, uh, who is the vice president of criminal justice at Arnold Ventures. And if you're not following Walter on Twitter, I strongly recommend you do that right now. It's He's one of those rare people on that platform where every time he tweets, uh, America gets a little smarter. Um, and so uh, we approached Walter about this forum and we told him we really wanted to get, you know, America's foremost experts together um, to really, you know, do a deeper dive on the policies that are on the table during these negotiations. And Walter said back to us, well, if you think I'm smart, you should meet my friends. And so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Walter and he's going to introduce our esteemed panel of experts. Thank you, Holly. Uh, following you is always uh a hurdle that has to be crossed. And I also want to thank uh, Congresswoman Bass. When uh, when we lived in California, this is now a decade ago, Congresswoman Bass was uh, the representative for our district and, and she was great. So thank you so much for your for your words. So I'm gonna welcome everyone to uh, who's joining us here for our panel discussion, where we will be in conversation uh, about the key issues around police accountability and transparency. And really the goal of this discussion today is to illuminate the issues surrounding police accountability, particularly those where Congress can take meaningful action. What we are seeing now is real momentum in these issues that have until recently been relegated to conversations amongst the experts and advocates that you see here today. So I'm thrilled to introduce this distinguished panel who are not only uh, esteemed experts, but I also consider uh, as friends and colleagues and they will help us bring clarity to the questions that policymakers are grappling with in areas such as qualified immunity, local government liability, and also tracking officer misconduct. So our first guest is Mark Levin. He is Chief Policy Counsel with the Council on Criminal Justice. Mark began the Texas Public Policy Foundation's criminal justice program in 2005. And in 2010, he developed the concept for the Right on Crime Initiative, to which he still serves as a senior advisor. Hi, Mark. Secondly, Maria Ponomarenko, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Minnesota, and she's the co-founder and counsel of the Policing Project at NYU Law. She's currently spearheading a project to draft model state legislation in a variety of policing issues and ranging from transparency to use of force standards. And finally, or as already mentioned by Holly, Joanna Schwartz, professor of law at the UCLA uh, School of Law. And she is one of the country's leading experts on police misconduct litigation. And her recent scholarship includes examining the, uh, the justifications for the qualified immunity doctrine, the financial impact of settlements and judgments, not only on law enforcement officers, but also on agency budgets and the regional variation in civil rights protections around the country. So welcome to all three of you. So let's get started. So let's first ask, what do we mean by that word accountability? 
And, and I generally describe those as the policies and procedures that do several things. First is they're designed to ensure that officers obey the law and treat civilians in a lawful, respectful, and unbiased manner. Secondly, to ensure that incidents of alleged misconduct are properly reported and then thoroughly and fairly investigated. Third, to ensure that proven incidents of misconduct result in appropriate discipline. And fourth, to ensure that police departments take proactive steps to prevent officer misconduct in the future. So with that as a background, let's start by asking a broad general question of what are the forms of accountability that occur following a police encounter where a member of the public is harmed either through alleged excessive force or by some other harm? And by that, I mean those civil, administrative, or, 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 or criminal pathways. Maria, can you st start by helping uh, describe what those paths are? Sure thing. So first, at the most granular level, there's internal agency discipline. So when an officer engages in misconduct, ideally, the department is going to investigate and hold that officer accountable. Um, if an individual is harmed, they can also bring suit either in state or federal court to seek money damages. And so they can also get compensated ideally for the harm that was caused. Um, and then finally, uh, particularly for kind of more serious or egregious instances of misconduct, there's criminal liability, which is to say an officer can be prosecuted criminally for the actions that they engaged in. Now, in terms of the criminal liability, that can occur both at the federal and the state level, is that correct? Correct. So at the state level, officers can be charged just like anybody else with assault, with homicide, with all of those kind of classic crimes. And then at the federal level, uh, statute's somewhat more limited. So an officer can be charged for depriving somebody of their constitutional rights. Uh, but in order for somebody to be prosecuted, they have to actually know that they're violating somebody's constitutional rights and intentionally violate them, which turns out to be a pretty difficult bar to meet. Right, is that the willful deprivation of civil rights standard that we hear about? Exactly, so that's that willfulness standard that kind of adds a higher bar. So it's not enough to show that an officer, you know, intentionally fire, fired a weapon or intentionally uh, wanted to assault somebody. So you have to actually establish that the officer intended to violate somebody's constitutional rights. Okay, I appreciate that, thank you. Now, when we talk about the administrative investigations, what we're talking about there is that uh, an incident occurs and the police department or perhaps even a civilian uh, investigative agency investigates to determine whether or not the officer violated policy. And if there is a finding of a sustained allegation, a decision is made over how the officer should be disciplined, including up to and including being discharged or fired from the department. But one of the problems that has been identified is that an officer can be uh, fired for egregious misconduct in one department and then show up somewhere else working at a different department. Mark, can you talk about that a little bit about why it is important to have some sort of way to uh, track officer misconduct or whether or not an officer is appropriately certified? Yes, absolutely. And a number of states, interestingly, have passed bills relating to teachers who were terminated for could be sexual misconduct with a student or something far less than that, but nonetheless, uh, perennially poor performance. And uh, other school districts can look up and see that uh, on their record. And so we have that same challenge with police officers. And of course, some federal um, framework is needed to ensure that across state lines, um, police departments don't unwittingly hire someone who's had a, a terrible record in a department in another state. And of course, the other issue that relates to this is there are not, uh, every state has very different standards for decertification. And some have even different standards among departments for what, what is misconduct. But um, some states, uh, there are very few officers decertified like Georgia, where other states much higher number are decertified because it's a different bar. So uh, that's obviously being worked through in the policing, uh, uh, the language in these two, uh, the House and Senate bills. But one of the other things I also wanted to mention is there are uh, some other uh, forms of accountability potentially in addition 
relation to civil and criminal liability, and of course, uh, filing an internal disciplinary complaint. And by the way, it's important to make sure people can file even just a complaint about an officer being rude, that they can go online and fill out a simple form because that's frequently not the case. Um, you also have 50 states have compensation funds uh, for victims of police misconduct, but there are lots of limitations, um, including the person generally, and many of them can't have been doing anything wrong, which is which is uh, really shouldn't be there because two wrongs don't make a right. We learned that in elementary school. But beyond uh, all of that, um, I think the one other thing I'll just mention is um, many departments, the policing project has pointed out that uh, only about half of all police departments uh, even post their policies online. And then of those, uh, just a handful have it uh, such so that it's searchable and easily accessible. So the average citizen, of course, it's not an issue with the uh, serious uh, uh, use of force misconduct, but with you know lesser issues, it's difficult for the average citizen to figure out whether what the officer did was in fact a violation when the policies are not posted. Yeah, and I agree with you. I mean, if you look at a lot of police departments, uh, they may have policies online, but they may be in an unsearchable PDF image. Mm. Uh, other departments may have a search function, which is really ha hard to go through, and others have no policies whatsoever. So you, you, you raise a great point. Now let's turn, and we want to spend quite a bit of time on this. Uh, let's turn to civil liability. Uh, Joanna, what are the pathways for parties harmed by the police to pursue a civil action? I know that's a super high level question, but let's, can we start there? Of course, uh, and thank you uh, to everyone for, for being here and for having us here. Uh, just as there are both a, a state and a federal pathway uh, toward criminal prosecution, there, is, uh, there are state and federal pathways uh, for civil lawsuits. Um, in the federal system, there is a statute that was passed uh, during Reconstruction in the years uh, after the Civil War, uh, which is referred to as Section 1983, which refers to its place in the U.S. Code. Uh, but Section 1983 allows people to uh, bring claims uh, for constitutional violations, violations of, of federal constitutional uh, law against individuals who, um, uh, who violated their rights. Um, they also can be brought against the local governments if uh, the plaintiff can prove that there was an unconstitutional policy or custom that led to the violation of their constitutional rights. So in that federal system, a person who has been, uh, had their constitutional rights violated by a police officer uh, can sue that officer for excessive force or an unlawful search or arrest uh, or a violation of their first amendment rights and also sue the local government uh, employer for having an unconstitutional policy or custom. Um, and uh, they can seek money. Um, they can also seek uh, injunctive relief, court orders uh, that a, a city stop doing something. Um, there are multiple uh, challenges and standards, uh, including qualified immunity, including uh, difficult standards to overcome to establish city liability and difficult standards to overcome to uh, establish the need for an injunction. But that's the general framework in the federal system. In the state system, uh, you can uh, bring uh, state law court claims um, against police officers. Uh, there's wide variation um, state to state. In some states uh, don't allow those kind of sort state tort claims really to be brought uh, hardly at all. Others have uh, more lenient um, uh, systems and there's variation in rules about when and under what circumstances um, local governments can be held responsible as well. Well, thank you for that. And I, and I know for some folks maybe listening to this and saying that was just a, a torrent of information. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to tease these apart a little bit and, and kind of take one at a time. Uh, uh, a little bit on qualified immunity, then want to talk about that, that local municipal liability, you talked about policy or custom, and, and finally about that injunctive relief, because in, in my view, that is an area which has been, uh, not, not a lot of focus, a focus has gone on that, but it could be a powerful weapon. So about, uh, there's been a lot of discussion lately about qualified immunity. Uh, Joanna, can you in a nutshell explain what qualified immunity is uh, for, for a layperson's understanding? Absolutely. Uh, so qualified immunity is a defense 
that uh, individual officers can raise uh, to protect themselves from these damages suits, from money awards. And uh, it's a defense that was created by the Supreme Court back in 1967. It started out as a defense for officers who were acting in good faith, um, but the standard has shifted over time. The Supreme Court has made that standard more and more difficult to get uh, or to, to, uh, to overcome. Um, the Supreme Court first said, we don't have to worry about officers intent anymore. Let's just look at whether the law was clearly established, the Supreme Court said. And if it's not, uh, then no constitutional violation. And then the Supreme Court has narrowed and narrowed and narrowed what the definition of clearly established law is. So that today, officers are entitled to qualified immunity unless the plaintiff in the lawsuit can find a prior court decision from the United States Supreme Court or from the next level down, the Court of Appeals, that has held virtually identical conduct to be unconstitutional. Uh, and that can mean the, the distinction between whether in the prior case and the current case someone was sitting down or standing up um, about whether something was said before, before the, the, uh, the use of force happened or not. Uh, the size of the person, uh, they, can be, they can be very minor factual distinctions. If there's not a prior case with virtually identical facts, the Supreme Court has said, uh, then the officer is entitled to qualified immunity and the plaintiff in the case uh, will not recover from that officer. And, and so is that based on the concept that the officer has not had sufficient notice that the, the conduct in question is unconstitutional? Uh, that is the, uh, one of the justifications is about financial liability, shielding officers from financial liability. Uh, a, a, but yes, a driving um, uh, notion is that officers need notice of those cases. I will say, I, I have just published a study that looks at trainings and policies for California, hundreds of California law enforcement agencies. And what I found is that despite the fact that the Supreme Court says that we have qualified immunity so that officers can be on notice, officers actually aren't trained about the facts and holdings of any of the cases that clearly establish the law for the Supreme Court's standard. So uh, it, is, it is like much of qualified immunity uh, justifications, really an illusion. I, and there's even like an, there's so many uh, examples which are just hair raising. Uh, one, for example, is um, after a foot pursuit, uh, the subject voluntarily uh, sat down and, and raised his hands up and an officer uh, still released his, his dog who proceeded to seriously injured uh, the individual dog bites and that individual sued and the officer claimed qualified immunity. And there the court said, we can point to a case where a suspect after a foot pursuit laid down and stretched his arms out and got bit by the dog, but that is not the same set of facts as here. Is, is that the type of hair splitting that we are seeing in other types of cases? That is precisely the type of hair splitting that we are seeing in other types of cases. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there are there are almost too many to count. But but one that haunts me personally is a a case involving a man named Tony Timpa, who uh, was killed uh, after calling the police himself. He was having a mental uh, health crisis. Called the police asking for help. They came, found him, handcuffed him, tied his feet together, and then put their knees on his back and neck for 14 minutes until he died. And uh, the federal court in Texas granted qualified immunity because there was not a prior case on point. And there have been prior cases. There had been a prior case in the Fifth Circuit, which is the Court of Appeals where Texas sits, where it was held to be unconstitutional to hog tie someone and then put your knee on their neck or back. Hog tying is where someone is handcuffed and their feet are cuffed, and then the, the hands and feet are attached together. The difference for Tony Timpa, his hands and feet weren't, were, were both restrained, but not attached. And so that's the distinction on which qualified immunity was granted to officers who did something that people around the 
world have watched and seen over the past year and, and agree uh, almost uh, unanimously um, is, a, is a horrific injustice. Well, really, thank you for that example. That is really stark. Uh, now, Maria, states are often laboratories for, for new ideas. So refer, before we kind of circle back to what Congress is considering, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what states like Colorado have been experimenting with in, in making alterations to qualified immunity? Sure. So a number of states, Colorado and New Mexico most recently, have abolished qualified immunity as a matter of state law. So what they've basically done is they've created a separate state cause of action uh, to sue an officer for violating uh, an individual's rights under the state constitution. And for that, uh, they've said that qualified immunity doesn't apply. So an officer can be held liable for violating somebody's rights without kind of enjoying that good faith defense. And, and so essentially, it, it turns the burden on its on its head a little bit, right? So that the officer is a higher burden to overcome uh, to try to achieve uh, immunity. Uh, yeah, so states have taken a variety of approaches. So some have flipped the burden. So uh, they've said basically, if there is a state law or uh, city ordinance that authorizes what they've done, then the officer can still get qualified immunity. So if some you know higher authority says what the officer did was okay, then they won't be held liable. Uh, but it doesn't fall to the plaintiff to say that you know nobody before or that a court has said that what the officer did was illegal. Thanks. Mark, uh, in, in, any thoughts on, on some innovative ideas which we, or Congress, can be thinking about and how to make uh, modifications so that the bar is not that high? Yes, and Maria, the last um, uh, proposal she described was actually Senator Braun's proposal as well in the last session of Congress. Um, so um, I think that there's so many problems with the current regime. Um, one thing for, for people to know is that there are uh, judgments paid out now. It's just that it's very hard for plaintiffs to get over the bar, um, the clearly established test in particular um, that uh, Professor Schwartz described. Now, if they do, then they have to hope that the city is going to indemnify the officer because most officers don't carry insurance. And even if they did, it wouldn't have the type of coverage, the amount that uh, a, a municipality would in terms of their own pockets or the municipality's insurer. Um, yeah, we're, we're, so, gonna, we're gonna dive into indemnification uh, sure, about sure. next, yeah. So, but the, I did wanna just point out 99% of the money that's paid out now is through indemnification. So I know there are understandable concerns about officers, um, you know, and their own financial um, uh, burden. The, um, I think that the, one of the things that's really, I think critical to understand is what Professor Schwartz said about um, officers aren't reading these court decisions and heck, they've got <laughs> a busy uh, and very difficult job. And then the other thing is there's actually research show, uh, which we talked about in the Council on Criminal Justice Assessment on this topic, that, that they're not thinking about civil litigation when they make split second decisions, which you know is totally what you would think. Um, but there's a market mechanism where you can, um, through uh, judgments, um, you can you can hope to influence the practices of a department, including training, for example, uh, to incentivize the types of practices that will make excessive force less likely to happen. And just to give a specific example, even now, um, there was a, a small a California town called Maywood, and they had an insurance policy. And they had so many claims against them that they insurers said, you've got to adopt this list of reforms to reduce excessive use of force. And ultimately they declined to do so. And what happened is their insurer dropped them and that community went to the is now uh, protected by the sheriff's uh, department rather than uh, they don't have a police department anymore. So I believe that we can through, um, that's an extreme case, but we can through market mechanisms um, uh, have uh, a real incentive, not so much for the individual officer, but for departments themselves. Yeah, thinking through how to where risk applies and how agencies think about the risks their departments are facing, I think is an important question, which does tie into that question about indemnification. So let's let's move on to that in a little bit. And let me just, for those listening and let's just step back for a second and say, let's say you're, let's say you're a plaintiff and you brought a, a lawsuit under section 1983. And let's say that you are successful and you've been able to establish that the officer is liable for violating your civil rights and the city offers a settlement or uh, you go to trial 
and there's a judgment in your favor. Uh, who pays, who writes that check generally uh, for that successful suit against a police officer? Joanna? Uh, it is uh, virtually always the, uh, the city that pays the check in those cases. And that is for a reason that has nothing to do with qualified immunity. Uh, it is because uh, of a concept called indemnification. Um, which is an agreement, a contract that exists in the private sector as well as the government sector, uh, that if a person is sued um, for work that they are doing for an employer, that the employer agrees to provide them with a lawyer and to pay any settlement or judgment entered against them uh, for work, you know, for, for a harm that arose out of their work. And uh, states across the country have indemnification statutes um, they vary in their terms about what they cover and what they don't cover, um, but there, there are those protections across the country uh, by state law. Then local governments have their own indemnification policies. Sometimes they're written into union agreements and, and sometimes uh, you know, other, otherwise. But those indemnification statutes um, are, generally speaking, what um, the, the agreements under which someone is paid if they're successful. So I looked at settlements and judgments in 81 jurisdictions across the country over a, a, a six year period. And I found that police officers paid 0.2% of the dollars that were paid to plaintiffs in those cases. 99.98% was paid uh, by local governments. I found two places that confirmed that officers had contributed. It was in New York, New York City and Cleveland. The average that they paid was officers contributed in those cases was $2,000. Um, now, this does not mean that officers are always indemnified. Uh, there are circumstances where local governments refuse to indemnify officers, but for a variety of reasons, um, it ultimately means that officers still don't pay when they're denied indemnification. It can be that an individual is denied indemnification, but the local government agrees to a global settlement that includes their, their claims. Um, it also is related to the dynamics of civil litigation uh, for the reasons that, that Mark said, uh, most officers don't have the resources to satisfy a settlement or judgment. And so in the rare instance in which they are actually denied indemnification, there tends to be not much economic reason to go after um, those officers' pockets, uh, those officers individually. Um, and I wanna say just one quick uh, connection to the, to the broader point uh, that, that Mark had mentioned before. Uh, this does mean that local governments um, pay, and there are often stories in the newspaper about the, the large, you know, many millions of dollars spent on those settlements and judgments. But I, and there are a few examples of cases like Maywood that have small jurisdictions where they have had a bunch of suits uh, and then essentially lost their insurance um, and had to disband their, law, their police department. But in the vast majority of jurisdictions, settlements and judgments make up less than 1% of local government's budgets. And even in small jurisdictions, insurance premiums, because those smaller jurisdictions are reliant on, 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 premium, on insurance, uh, those premiums amount to less than 1% of most uh, small jurisdictions' budgets. So I want to sort of push against the idea that these settlements and judgments are bankrupting officers and also push against the idea that they're bankrupting local governments. And are the, thank you so much for that explanation. Now, are these settlements that are being paid out by the city, are, they, are those coming from the police budget or from somewhere else? It's a great question. Um, and there's variation. This is another thing that I have studied. And uh, what I have found is um, that uh, it can come from a number of different sources. Sometimes it is simply taken from general, the general budget. Um, sometimes different agencies, including the police department, pay into a central fund, and then the money to pay settlements and judgments comes from comes out of that central litigation fund. Sometimes the settlements and judgments are taken from police departments' budgets, but the formal arrangements don't really uh, tell the full story because in a place like Chicago, uh, settlements and judgments are taken from the police department's budget, but when the police department's litigation budget runs out, they simply go back to the city council and the city council takes the rest of the money from the, you know, from the central uh, budget um, or from another source. So ultimately, although there is some variation in the formal or budgeting arrangements, 
settlements and judgments in police misconduct suits very rarely have any tangible financial impact on the police department's ability to hire officers, buy equipment, um, and the like. Well, well having helped write uh, the Chicago Police Department budget uh, on a couple of occasions, I can attest that your description is 100% right and that the number put into the budget at the beginning of the year may or may not reflect what happened in the prior year. Uh, but yes, then that number is blown past and then we just pull it back out from somewhere else. Um, and I think that's important for people to know that ultimately when we talk about officer or agency liability, we're talking about the taxpayer's money. And so when we're talking about police policies or police behavior, it is not just a person who's directly impacted who had that encounter. It is also the dictating where our resources go from our tax money in the future. So if we think about that, about liability costs, and we think about uh, uh, people who are harmed being made whole, Maria, how do we keep track of that? I mean, you've done quite a bit of work on, on thinking about data collection and data transparency. When it comes to litigation, what is it that, that, that jurisdictions should be collecting and publicizing? Uh, so that's a great question. Uh, so first, if I can just take a step back for a moment, I mean, it seems really jarring to say that, you know, we're the ones who are on the hook for officer misconduct, but I do think it's important to remember that, you know, officers aren't free agents. So officers can't, you know, put up a shingle and become a cop and go out there and police. I mean, they are policing on behalf of agencies and lots of the issues that we see in policing are because agencies tell them to go out and you know stop lots of people and ostensibly hire crime neighborhoods or to engage in um, you know various forms of conduct that generate a lot of harms and so um, you know that's just important to remember as we talk about these liability structures is there's a reason why agencies pay. Uh, but as to your question, you know, one of the reasons why we don't really see a lot of consequences for cities or for agencies is because people don't know what is being paid out. And so we have a draft transparency statute that would require agencies to report every single settlement and judgment uh, to make clear, you know, generally what the allegation was, uh, how much was paid out, and to kind of report this on an ongoing uh, way, uh, both on the own kind of agency's website, but also to report it to the state so that it's possible to kind of aggregate data from all agencies and apply, um, compare agencies across the board. And California, I know, uh, has proposed something along these lines, but as far as I know, that's the only state that's considered it. And, and Mark, how do yeah. we bring more sunshine to this? Well, sure. And I think actually we need to bring sunshine to the origin of qualified immunity because it wasn't a law passed by Congress. Uh, it was a judicial doctrine uh, that the Supreme Court kind of superimposed on Section 1983. And of course, Justice Clarence Thomas, among others, has pointed out that it really was not contrary to what the Supreme Court said established in common law. So it, it was wrong to assume that Congress intended to um, have this exception when they didn't put in anything in Section 1983 in the language to create it. But the, it, to the extent there was an exception in common law, it was really around ministerial actions where an officer, for example, the warrant the officer got from a judge had the wrong person, wrong name on it. That uh, was not intended to, it didn't in common law apply to discretionary conduct like excessive use of force, which is obviously most of what we're talking about today. So the, the other thing that I think is just really important is to bring in this issue of sovereign immunity and the Monell decision, because that Supreme Court decision basically said you can only directly sue the agency or the local government if you can show they had a policy or a custom of deprived people of their civil rights and who's going to write that down so it for all practical purposes it's impossible to sue the agency directly so the, their liability is derivative through indemnity from being able to hold the officer liable but what happens in situations where let's say the real fault wasn't with the officer at all but it was just bad policies lack of training on the part of the department and if we actually if congress actually reversed the monel decision we wouldn't have to have 
uh, the sovereign's liability entirely tied or tied even at all to the officers, and people could more easily just sue uh, local government. Now that brings in finally, though, the issue of the taxpayers, right? Um, and I think that if you look at medical malpractice, for example, many states have capped damages on on how much you can get in, in terms of not compensatory, but punitive, and, and and in some places pain and anguish. So because they didn't want to put doctors or hospitals out of business, but they did want to ensure people that are injured or in some cases, sadly their survivors could at least get a just and reasonable uh, uh, award for compensatory damages. So that's kind of, I think, uh, hopefully gives people a sense of, uh, of the backdrop to this from both a legal perspective and a perspective making sure that, you know, the overall rule should be where there's an injury, there's a remedy. And, and that has to guide us, I think, here. That's a great phrase, uh, where there's an in about the remedy. Let, let's unpack this question a little bit about municipal liability or, or local government liability. Um, this may be, uh, analogies are always tricky. So this is, let, let's just create one anyway. Um, an airline pilot, um, he's employed by an airline uh, and he decides uh, to one day land a plane at, let's say, at Midway Airport and, and uh, not fully deploy the landing gear. Uh, and it doesn't go well. Uh, and, and, you know, there's injuries, people are harmed. Let's say in this example, luckily nobody gets killed, but people are hurt. But who is ultimately responsible in such a situation is the employer. And to, doesn't that make sense that the employer is held responsible for the actions of the employee while he was operating in the course of business. Uh, Joanna, does that apply in the same way to uh, a police officer who's an employee of the city? No, uh, in, in those circumstances, so, so if, you, if you imagined the current standards for civil rights suits to apply to your example, uh, the, the plaintiff who was injured on that plane in order to hold the airline liable, they would either need to find a policy in the airline's policy manual saying, you do not need to deploy your landing gear when you are landing, unlikely to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, they would need to have uh, this pilot, if they wanted to make a claim that he was improperly hired, that that pilot in the past had failed to deploy his landing gear. So in other words, that he had done precisely the same thing not just that they were on notice that he was a bad pilot, but that he was a pilot who didn't use his landing gear. Um, also very difficult to find. Or third, for a failure to supervise, um, they would need to show that this pilot and or, and or other pilots had failed to use their landing gear multiple times. Not just that they were bad pilots, but they had failed to do this precise thing multiple times so that failing to train them about this would be a deliberate indifference. And you can see, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here. There's a Supreme Court case uh, with a man who uh, was there in, uh, was prosecuted by uh, the New Orleans uh, prosecutor, came within a, a year of, of, the, of death, the death penalty, uh, when it was revealed that the prosecutors had failed to turn over blood evidence that showed that he was innocent. And there, that same prosecutor's office had had multiple other exonerations for failure to turn over evidence. The Supreme Court said that was not enough because even though it's very rare that a that evidence that failing that it's it comes to, to light that a prosecutor has failed to disclose um, evidence under their constitutional obligations. There had been multiple in this in these circumstances. But those other circumstances didn't involve blood evidence. And even though prosecutors aren't trained about their, their obligations to turn over this kind of evidence, it doesn't vary based on the type of evidence. But because it wasn't exactly the same, the Supreme Court said they were not deliberately indifferent. They didn't know that they had to train them differently. And so getting uh, to establish local government liability is, is as difficult, although different, then proving qualified immunity. For qualified immunity, the plaintiff has to find a prior court decision with virtually identical facts that happened to someone else. For local government liability, the plaintiff has to find that other people or the, or the, uh, the officer in the case 
did the same thing and it was found to be wrong in the past and that the policymakers knew about it. So it's a very difficult standard to get. As we've, as we've discussed, as a practical matter, even if a local government is uh, not found to uh, have this unlawful policy or custom, they may still end up paying um, through indemnification. Uh, but we've also talked about the fact that that's not certain. Um, and there have been multiple instances that I've found in my research where local governments have used the threat that they will deny officers indemnification in order to gain strategic benefits at trial or to gain a reduced settlement. I've seen examples of government attorneys having their uh, law enforcement officer defendants testify about their limited resources and their mortgages and their child support payments as reasons to not have to pay damages or reduce the damages that they have to pay only to indemnify them at the end. So a benefit of, I, I'm, I think that having joint and several liability between the individual officer and the local government makes the most sense. Um, and it would mean that local governments could not use that threat um, of uh, denying indemnification uh, to, to, to avoid those kinds of harms. But bringing the claim against a, a local government and expecting that that will solve the problems with qualified immunity, for example, uh, really do, it doesn't hold water because there are so many challenges in bringing those claims as well. Maria, with all those challenges, uh, at the top I described the, the four types of accountability and the fourth was ensuring that police departments take proactive steps to prevent officer misconduct in the future. If we think uh, about civil liability or civil litigation as perhaps being creating an incentive to take those proactive steps. I'm not hearing much of an incentive here. What are your thoughts about that? Well, so that's exactly the problem, which is, you know, ordinarily it's the threat of liability, the potential that, you know, misconduct is going to be really expensive for the agency or that their premiums are going to go up that creates the incentive to, you know, invest and in actually reducing the risk of harm, to invest in training, to uh, invest in policy development so that officers aren't uh, engaging in practices that are likely to generate injury. And that's partly what's missing is that feedback loop. So officers are rarely held liable, agencies are rarely held liable. And so as a result, uh, we don't have that kind of external incentive for departments to make change. So uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, staying cognizant of the time. This has been a, a fabulous conversation. So before we open for Q&A, I wanna do this. I wanna, I wanna go around the table and uh, you know, hand each of you the, the, uh, the metaphorical magic wand and ask, you know, what is it within this realm of what we've been talking about, uh, qualified immunity, uh, municipal liability, indemnification, we didn't even talk about the Lyons cases or you know, trying to seek injunctive relief. What is it that you would think would be a powerful policy change in this realm? Maria? So, I mean, I tend to be with Joanna in the sense that we should in theory have liability for both officers and agencies, but I guess if I had to pick one, I would say municipal liability. You know, as I mentioned again, it's officers aren't going out there and making these choices on their own. They work for agencies and it's agencies that are deciding what they can and can't do. And so if there's you know, one choice, it would be to ensure that agencies have that incentive to affect change. Mark, how about you? Thank you, Maria. Mark? Well, and I, I, I agree with that. And in fact, you know, with the Amazon driver, that's another example, no, not to pick on them, but if, if they run you or your child over in the neighborhood today, heaven forbid, the driver's negligent, at least in Texas, I can tell you Amazon's gonna have to pay. Um, and, you know, it's because it's within the scope, as you said earlier, within the scope of, of your employment. And so even if the dr driver was just negligent, he didn't intentionally do it, Amazon is, is going to pay for that in their insurer. The, um, and so the, and, and what it happens is, of course, uh, officers who have uh, numerous verified complaints and judgments against them, and it's a very small percentage account for the vast majority of misconduct, they will become unemployable. And that's how that incentive can work, even just through uh, departmental liability. 
accountability. And, you know, so I think that that's um, very promising. And uh, I, I really think we have to focus on the fact that the current system is producing inconsistent results. And so when you have those cases that do get through the, um, you know, clearly established bar, right, you might get a payout. It could be 50, 100, 150 million. There's no limit. And, and I think that as we hopefully make these changes to open this to more cases, more people getting at least compensatory damages, we do have to look at, uh, you know, the fact that we may need some limit, for example, on punitive damages, just so that the system continues to be affordable. And I believe that actually having more cases result in some justice will incentivize change more than just having a handful of cases get through and then have a, a few extremely large awards. Very interesting thought, Mark. Joanna, last to you uh, with your magic wand. Well, you know, my mag the way my magic wand works, it doesn't just attack one problem. You know, if, if I had my magic wand, it would do a lot of things. Uh, and I think that key to, um, you know, maybe a key takeaway from the, the question, not to, not to fight the hypothetical, um, is that there are multiple barriers. Um, qualified immunity is, is one, and it, I think it's very important. And I think symbolically, it is very powerful. Um, and for those reasons, I think it is, it is important to um, eliminate. Uh, and, you know, that might be my first step, but it would certainly not be my only step, because I think that if we are going to have Section 1983 suits compensate and deter, which is what the statute was intended to do when it was passed uh, in the years after the Civil War, uh, we need to make sure that local governments are paying. Absolutely, I, I, I do think that, uh, whether through indemnification or vicarious liability or joint and several liability. But then we also need to make sure that these lawsuits deter. And creating, uh, whether it's a feedback loop uh, to make sure that information from these suits are integrated into local government uh, decision-making, whether it is ensuring that those officers um, suffer some manner of financial sanction as the, the Colorado statute that's been recently enacted does. Uh, if it is local governments requiring that as a condition of budgeting and indemnifying officers that local governments and police departments do more with that information um, and have some manner of, of that built into accreditation requirements, for example. I think there's a lot of different ways to achieve the deterrence piece. Um, the compensation piece needs to happen through, to my mind, local government picking up the tab. But I want to do that in a way that still maintains some manner of deterrence for the individual officer as well as the department. Well, well, thank you so much for that. And we only have time for a couple of questions. So um, we received quite a few. One of the questions that I see, and this comes up a lot, is uh, should officers be required to carry their own individual professional liability insurance? What would that accomplish? What are some of the, the pitfalls we should be thinking about? Mark? Well, um, it, I think it's something we should definitely look at. I, I think that um, we, we need to figure out what the cost would be, but I think it's the case that um, where officers have insurance now, individual insurance, their departments typically pay uh, the premiums. So I think that in fact, it probably would be affordable. Um, and again, that's going to depend kind of on, I said, if we're going to have more successful claims, which I think we need, making sure that you don't have, you know, a punitive damage award of $200 million or, or something like that, that's going to drive up everybody's premiums, which is what we dealt with here in Texas with obstetricians. So that's how we ended up with medical malpractice caps. Um, so, I, I, but I, yes, I think that it would be desirable because it would, in addition to, of course, uh, insurance for agencies, it would uh, promote a market mechanism uh, to address this problem. Thanks. Uh, and, and Joanna, I had a question here, uh, which came, oh, here it is. What do you think, and we may have already touched on this, uh, one of the biggest misconceptions uh, about the qualified immunity discussion going on right now? Terrific. Um, so I think that uh, when the, the defenders of qualified immunity uh, say the same things um, about the doctrine, and it's really a, it's really a, a, a a scary story about what would happen if uh, qualified immunity were to go away. And the argument is basically that, um, uh, that officers who are acting, uh, making good faith mistakes um, will be bankrupted um, for those mistakes. 
And we've talked already about one of the reasons that that's not true, which is that officers virtually never pay, um, even when uh, qualified immunity is defeated because of these indemnification rules. The other really important thing to keep in mind is that good faith mistakes, reasonable mistakes made under the split second decisions um, is already protected by the constitution. The United States Supreme Court has interpreted the Fourth Amendment, which protects against unreasonable searches and seizures, to allow officers to make mistakes. If they've made reasonable mistakes, they have not violated the Constitution. The language of a case called Graham versus Connor, which sets out the standard for excessive force, explicitly says we should look at officers' behavior under the totality of the circumstances, recognizing that they need to make split-second judgments, not from 2020 hindsight. And so this, this uh, discussion about why qualified immunity is necessary turns on two things, two qualities that already exist in the system without it. Widespread indemnification, virtually certain indemnification, and the protections of the Fourth Amendment, which already protect officers from constitutional consequences for making good faith mistakes. Fabulous conversation. Uh, amazingly, it, we're already at time. Uh, I want to thank all three of our panelists, Maria Ponomarenko, Mark Levin, and Joanna Schwartz for joining us to discuss uh, these questions of accountability relating to civil liability as well as uh, criminal liability. Uh, thank you so much for your in-depth answers and really for all three of you, the years of work that you have put into, into these really critical topics. Uh, now I'm going to hand it back over to Sarita to close out the event. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Walter, for moderating this conversation and to our excellent panelists, Maria, Mark, and uh, Joanna, for your insight. Uh, a big special thank you to Congresswoman Bass for all the hard work that she has done uh, and the work that she continues to do on policing reform. And of course, thank you all to our audience for joining today. Uh, we hope this conversation was insightful and that you, you know, received some information that you can take back to your offices as you continue to do this work. If you need to get in touch with any of the panelists today or any of the JAN staff, you can reach out to me at my email. It's uh, Sarita at Justice Action Network. That's S-Y-R-I-T-A at Justice Action Network. This event today has been recorded and so we'll post it on all of our social media, media sites on Monday. Our website is uh, www.justiceactionnetwork.org. Our Twitter is at US Justice Action and our Facebook is at Justice Action Network. So thank you all again today for joining and have a great weekend. Bye.